Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining from. Uh, this is afternoon, actually sunny afternoon from Delft. Uh, in fact, pretty warm afternoon, I must say. Uh, welcome to this webinar on technical debt. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Today, we depending are going to explore what does it mean for you as a product owner in understanding or knowing technical debt. If you are a developer or part of a development team, what does it mean for you to understand what technical debt is and uh, how to deal with it? So this webinar is going to be focused on these three key roles. If you are a product owner, what does it mean for you? If you are a developer or a part of the development team, either as a developer or a QA, what does it mean to you? And if you are a IT manager or a, de a delivery lead, what does it mean to you? So that's that's what we are going to explore in next 45 minutes. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded, so you will receive a link uh, uh, of the video and the slides uh, of this. Even though I'm going to use the flip chart, you will receive a slide with all the information which I'm going to uh, present here. And uh, if you have any questions, please do put them in chat window. I have my colleague here, Lisa, who is helping me to monitor the chat window. Uh, I'll get to know your questions uh, through her, and I'll uh, answer them uh, during these 45 minutes. All right, let's get started. So what is technical debt? As you can see, this is more like a, uh, it's sort of a karma of the development team. Depending on if you do good karma, so you will have a good result and vice versa. Well. Uh, technical debt is a metaphor which was coined by uh, Ward Cunningham uh, basically to emphasize that like in financial debt, you also, if you, if you incur some financial debt, you need to pay some interest and if you don't pay, then you go into like financial bankruptcy and things like that. So in, in 92, he was working with uh, one of the customers and there he had to emphasize why the it is important to maintain uh, high uh, quality standards for the applications that they were building. Uh, so he used that analogy to sort of depict if you don't maintain certain standards, uh, the similar way you declare a financial bankruptcy, at some point you also need to declare technical bankruptcy if you don't address it. Uh, I like to think technical debt in a, in a, in a uh, different metaphor. Um, it's like, uh, let's say you like to cook and on one Friday evening you invited your friends uh, uh, to, to cook some delicious uh, food uh, and then while cooking in your kitchen, slowly the kitchen becomes a little bit messier over a period of time. However, you don't try to clean the kitchen every time there is some mess. You probably will wait to finish the whole cooking and maybe in between if there is a too much uh, pile up then probably you might clear in the same way the technical debt is also some sort of a, a, the accumulation of the poor decisions the development team makes during the new feature development same way you clean up kitchen once you're done with cooking development team needs to go back and clean up their code base what happens if you don't clean up your kitchen uh, so maybe one day yeah, still you can live in the same house two days yes but if you don't clean up your kitchen let's say for a week then all the garbage is piled up all the messy dishes are there then it becomes unbearable exactly same thing happens when you have a code base where you do not do some proper cleanup so that's that's at a metaphoric level now let's take a step uh, in in detail uh, and explore the topics which we are going to address in next 40 minutes we are going to look at what causes this technical debt. So is it only the development team? Uh, or what role do you play as a business, as a product owner? And more importantly, how do you reduce it? Or how do you manage technical debt? And uh, some pitfalls to avoid. So these are the kind of things that we are going to explore in detail. All right, let's start with a question. Is all technical debt bad? Because I keep hearing this term whenever I talk to some 
development managers or uh, uh, some development teams, they say, oh, we have a lot of technical debt we got to, yeah, we, we got to fix it. Yeah, sure, technical debt is definitely, yeah, not a nice thing to have. But the key thing to understand is it, there is always a, a, a trade-off between uh, how much technical debt that you can incur. So before I start, I want to set the context that, yes, technical debt, don't think that it is always bad. Sometimes it is also good to accumulate certain technical debt so you can speed up or go to market sooner or uh, do some proof of concepts. However, it becomes bad if you don't repay it. Same way like when you're cooking, your kitchen becomes messier, but that's not the problem. The problem is if you don't come back and clean it up. So that's the problem. All right. Uh, so what are the some examples of uh, technical debt? Uh, if these are the constant things when I coach teams, uh, when I hear things like that, oh, that piece of code only that person can touch. If anyone else touches it, oh, no, nobody else understands. So maybe that sounds like a good area that uh, the team has accumulated technical data in that aspect. Uh, if you hear things like last time when we touched that part of code, we didn't go home during weekend. Yeah, maybe that's a good part that uh, uh, team needs to explore a little bit more in detail. Uh, it's like, and also sometimes here, oh, that refactoring, that's okay, we'll do it next time, or maybe next week, or maybe next release. That is also a cause of concern because then they are postponing some cleanup work to a later point of time. Next week, maybe next two weeks, maybe fine. But when you hear things, okay, let's do it next release, or maybe three months down the lane, not so nice. Okay. Now, why should you care about technical debt? So, we talked about some aspects. Uh, why should you care about technical debt if you are a product owner or if you are someone from business? So, for next five minutes i want to focus more on what does it mean for you as a from a business or a product owner point of view and from a development team point of view now let's look at if you are someone from business or a, since most of my examples are the, the context that i'm going to talk is more based on the scrum teams so i'm going to refer business as product owner from now on but if you are not using scrum it could be someone within the business who really funds your team, who is the sponsor of your uh, product development. Yeah. So if you are a product owner, what you would like your development team to do is deliver more and more features sprint after sprint. However, very quickly you realize the team sort of delivers less and less features. Instead, the remaining time what they are doing is they are spending considerable amount of time and effort into something called maintenance activities. So if I capture this as new feature development and this could be something called maintenance. So maintenance could be fixing defects from previous sprints. Maintenance can be doing a lot of manual testing, manual regression testing. Maintenance could be taking, simply taking more time to develop the same feature. Let's say a team which built a similar feature uh, six months back within one sprint, but after six months, if they start accumulating more technical debt, a similar feature will probably cost you two sprints. So, which is which directly results in your total cost of ownership. So with more technical debt, your total cost of ownership goes up. The amount of time that you spend to build one feature directly goes up. So that's drawback number one as a, as a business, as a product owner. What's the drawback number two? Uh, the time it takes to really put a feature into the marketplace drastically increases. As you know, 
in the competitive age uh, as today, it is important, one of the key aspects as a differentiating factor between you and your competitor could be how soon you could respond to your customer needs. Now, with lot of technical debt accumulated in the systems, it puts you in a corner where you cannot really go to market with new features sooner. Maybe instead of taking only four weeks to ship a new feature to production, now with lot of technical debt accumulated, it might take maybe six weeks or 10 weeks, for example. So you are already late to market. So that has a direct impact on uh, the business proposition. So these are the two key aspects from a, a business standpoint of view, cost and time to market. Now let's look uh, from a development team point of view. What factors does result if you, why should you care uh, as, a, as a development team member about technical debt? Number one, it's the confidence. As a development team, you really want to be confident when you finish some things. You need to ensure that whatever you say it's done, whatever you ship to production does not break anything which was working previously and also ensures that whatever the new feature that you have built also works exactly the way you intended to. Now, with a lot of technical debt, you really don't know whether uh, you are accumulating a lot of technical debt and which results in some unknown defects and unknown bugs. What else could be, why should you care as a development team? The other thing is the no surprises. As a development team, you don't want to have really surprises. Things like, hey, this was working on my machine, my local machine. But when I put it to test environment or a integration environment, yeah, things doesn't work. Oh, that's a surprise for you. Why? Oh, because the configuration of the systems were different, the environments were different, the frameworks, all these things would matter because as a development team, you did not invest, for example, in this case, to maintain the consistency in, uh, different, um, across different environments. That is also a technical debt. So for me, I, qualify technical debt which slows down the team. Slows down doesn't mean that they code a feature in a slow fashion. Slows down also mean that they are not able to ensure that the things work the way they are supposed to work, which means they need either a lot of manual testing or they, uh, they depend on a lot of manual deployments or manual configuration. Everything qualifies as technical debt. Yeah. So, and what is the other thing? So, of course, the last one is uh, so being productive. As a development team, you would like to be more productive. Uh, because of the poor choices that were made, then you have to spend a lot of time on uh, re uh, doing a lot of manual stuff, which means, yeah, there is very less time to do really creative and innovation stuff. So these are the two key reasons, uh, two aspects from a technical debt, from a business point of view and from a development uh, team point of view. Now, let's move on to the next question. So now we understand what technical debt is and why is it important for teams to uh, sort of focus on it. But the, the question is, why, how do you measure it? That's an interesting question. How do you measure technical debt? The, Measuring technical debt is not always easy and there is no one way of measuring it. It's like measuring uh, the productivity. How do you measure? Some teams say, okay, there is a velocity, okay, you could measure, but we all know that that's a very poor matrix to measure. So now taking a step back, how do you measure technical debt? Or is it required to measure technical debt? So my short answer to it is absolutely do measure your technical debt. How do you do it? Well, there are a lot of tools, a lot of different methods to measure technical debt. But what is more important is you always try to have a KPI which you can easily communicate with all the stakeholders. Stakeholders as in the people who are building software, people who are going to use software, 
and people who are funding for that software. Why is it important? Because I hear uh, most of the time the development team says, oh, we, we have too much cyclometric complexity of this module, we got to do it. Oh, the unneeded dependencies are, a lot of un unneeded dependencies in this module, we got to address it. Yeah, so when, when you use terminology like this, it becomes really difficult for your business people to understand it. That's why I always suggest development teams, hey, if you find something like that, make it as a backlog item, put it and then estimate it and depending on how much time it is going to take, then convert it into a euro figure. Let's say if it takes um, one sprint to fix X amount of technical debt, okay, then one sprint cost me 15,000 euros, so 15,000 euros into amount of technical debt, so that gives a euro number. So the point is I am not suggesting that you should always convert technical debt into a financial number, but make sure you have a KPI through which you can talk to business uh, in the language they understand. Yeah. So that is how you probably could measure technical debt and as I said, a lot of tools already provide a lot of dashboards a lot of different KPIs, uh, but then how you project those numbers uh, and how you communicate with stakeholders, that plays a very important role. Now, let us look into the next aspect of what causes technical debt. Based on my experience, I have seen the top five uh, factors which contribute to accumulation of technical debt. What are those top five reasons? Um, the first one, sort of using a waterfallish approach. I am going to de uh, elaborate uh, uh, later. So what, what does it mean waterfall approach? So it is if the software that you are building, if you follow a traditional methodology to build software which means you have accumulated all the features, requirements up front, you have done this design up front, then you are going into a coding phase and then doing testing. So that is a traditional approach which we all are familiar with. One of the main reasons why a waterfall approach directly contributes to lot of technical debt is because lot of decisions are made up front. The problem is when you make lot of decisions up front, what decisions are we talking? The decisions like what are the requirements that we need in this particular piece of software? How are we going to build them? What is the design uh, of our system? So all those decisions are made up front and the problem with that is during the later part of the, your project execution when you decide to change some decisions, then it becomes a really difficult thing because always it is easy to make a new decision with more information as opposed to revisiting a, a existing decision and try to retrofit something. So I have seen a lot of teams accumulate a lot of technical debt when they try to yeah, work in a more traditional waterfallish setting. So what is the other factor, uh, what is reason number two which uh, results in lot of technical debt? Um, it could be more on, one of the thing is not focusing on core on core functionality. What do I mean by not focusing on core functionality? So, Couple of years back, I was working with a, a telecom expense management system. So where we have to do a lot of uh, 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 data processing and data analytics and things like that. And finally, we had to present it in a nice report to our stakeholders. What we figured out, so we wanted a, a type of a chart to represent some data. And then initially, we decided to actually build the whole chart component ourselves. So one of our colleagues spent more than a month to figure out or come up to, to code that chart component, but then it was going nowhere. 
and that is when we realized there is no point investing our time and effort into building some component which we can easily buy it from the market. Why is that? Because when you build something which is not part of your core functionality, then there is the chances of revisiting it when you have to change it drastically goes down. Instead, if you buy a third party utility or a tool or a framework which is very well maintained by other companies or um, where you can submit support uh, uh, tickets and get your things done, I suggest to opt for that because it is faster, because easy to maintain, because there is a completely separate team who can handle all the maintenance part and third, it allows you to focus more on your core functionality. So, my one of the uh, experiences what it said was uh, it is basically if you focus on something then you do it just for sake of finishing that particular piece, but you never go back and revisit and every time you have to change it then yeah, the, the quality deteriorates. So, what is the third factor? The third factor is a disregard to basic development practices. So, not following basic practices. So, this is something like um, as a team when you lack professionalism in terms of using uh, you know right design principles and practices, not adhering to the coding standards which are agreed by yourself and not having a mechanism to really review code. So, these are the basic this is what I qualify as uh, so basic development practices. If you do not do proper code reviews, if you do not follow design patterns, if you just copy paste code, if you do not follow naming conventions, all of them qualify you know that is also one of the key reason why you accumulate technical debt. It could be as low as the code quality to as high as a design decision. Do you use proper let us say class coupling and things like that. It could also more on the UI front, how do you design your UI? Uh, so, uh, once I was working with an application where we had to give some configuration screens to users. When we initially started, it, it had only four checkboxes where peop, the end users could check whatever they need uh, so that they configure that uh, functionality. But over a period of time, those four checkboxes grow into 23 checkboxes. Now, you can imagine how difficult it was for the user to really choose which one, which checkbox to turn on, turn off and things like that. The reason why it led was because every time there was a new customization, we just added another text box, checkbox every time. So, that is also I qualify that as also part of a basic uh, development practice because you also need to give enough focus on the, the UI or usability, uh, not only how you code, but also how focusing on how your end users use. All right. So, what else? What else qu uh, contributes to technical debt? The other contributing factor is uh, postponing non-functional requirements. So, all the non-functional requirements uh, such as doing security testing, load testing, performance and uh, even documents. So, I expand the scope of NFRs and put documentation and everything in it because a lot of times I have seen some development teams sort of try to postpone uh, work to a later sprint. Now, what does that mean? It means now at the, when they try to do these NFR testings, then they end up with uh, some unknown feedback, unknown amount of waste and then in order to fix it still to meet the timelines, you basically try to finish it. Uh, with a poor quality. So, this is also uh, one of the contributing factor which is postponing the feedback. And the last one uh, which is pretty important one we is lack of automation. Lack of automation it could be from a testing point of view not having a proper 
test frameworks, not having proper automation test suits, and it could also be from automating your day-to-day -day activities like deployments, like builds, like uh, creating uh, artifacts, you know, those kind of things. So this is also another contributing factor which results in accumulation of technical debt. So to sum it up, in my opinion, these are the five key factors which results in accumulation of technical debt in a, uh, for a development team. Now, moving on, uh, how do you deal with it? Uh, how do you deal, now we understood, okay, so what factors that might result in technical debt, now how do you deal with uh, this uh, technical debt? Uh, I would say, make sure you make your technical debt, make it visible. What do I mean by that? So, um, if you as a development team, if you come across any items, so this is a module that we need to work on, this is a, uh, something that we need to refactor, make sure those items are captured, put it in the product backlog, and it is visible to everyone. Remember what we discussed earlier, make sure you capture the technical debt items in such a way where your business can also understand. Uh, don't put everything in a, like a technical jargon. Of course, sometimes you can't avoid it, but try to make sure that you capture items in a way that where your business can understand. And make it visible also contributes to having some dashboards. It could be a Sonar dashboard, or it could be your TFS dashboard, or a build dashboard with some code metrics where in, in your team area where they are always visible. And another aspect to look from a make it visible part is I always suggest development teams to also talk about the code quality in every sprint review with their stakeholders. Always throw in a slide with how the key KPIs with respect to quality has changed in the previous sprint. So your stakeholders need not to understand in depth what each KPI means, but they should know enough whether it's a good thing or a bad thing if a KPI goes up or down. And as a development, I expect a scrum master or someone in a development team to educate your stakeholders on what kind, what those KPIs are and what it means for them. So that's one way to dealing with technical debt. Uh, the other way, so the second thing, so let me put it deal with The second way of dealing with uh, technical debt is obviously automate. Follow the three strike rule. If you have to do anything more than two times, by the time you are doing the third time, third time you do not do it. You do it via automation. That's the three strike rule. So it could be deployments, it could be testing, it could be documentation, it doesn't matter what it is. If you find yourself doing an activity for more than two times, the third time you, uh, uh, you automate. So this drastically helps in reducing or in fact avoiding technical debt. The other one is uh, make, uh, make sure you have some tools in place. What kind of tools are we talking about? So typically you could use, uh, well obviously we already discussed about Sonar Cube. So TFS also provides, if you are from a Microsoft background, TFS also provides some key code metrics. Uh, and there are other tools uh, such as uh, SonQ. But the key thing is you could use any of these tools, but make sure these tools are in place to provide you feedback instant, instantaneously. What do I mean by that? When you try to code something, automatically you should sort of get feedback immediately. Let's say if you have a Sonar plugin in your Eclipse editor, it automatically tells you when you violate some of the agreements that you made with the rule set. Yeah, uh, And the last thing, is
you work on it regularly. You do not postpone uh, your technical, uh, you know, working on the technical date for a later point of time. Working or dealing with technical date should be done in a consistent uh, fashion. Don't postpone it to a later point of time, which means, okay, we will have a, a stabilization sprint or we will have a release readiness sprint. Okay, we'll do it before we go to production. No, don't do it. Always try to work on these items every sprint. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's what I wanted to share with you on the technical debt for now. Do we have any questions? Lisa. Uh, we have not had any questions coming in yet. However, I believe I remember one really good question that I heard before. It's about uh, when you have uh, several teams that want to do an, uh, with which you are doing an agile transformation. Yeah. And all of them have a lot of technical debt. Should you first in invest the time in uh, clearing that technical debt or should you just start uh, the transformation? Yeah, okay, so that's a nice question. So I would suggest that it's also part of uh, your transformation. So the way you deal with it is if you have a lot of technical debt in your systems, you already know, you are already, you are already facing some of the pains that we discussed uh, in this webinar, then my suggestion is you start the agile transformation and you start dealing with technical debt together. Because one of the key thing while dealing technical debt uh, is you focus on technical debt, how you address it from a four different aspects. One, of course, you need some skill set for your development team, uh, you know, to increase their professionalism. Do the development teams have uh, enough skills to automate everything? Do they have enough skills to uh, work on things like uh, your test-driven development or things like focusing on incremental architecture or evolutionary design. So focusing on skills is one aspect. The other aspect is do you have, the, does your development team have access to right tools uh, to focus on technical debt? Uh, and the other thing is the process part. So of course you might have these tools but if you follow a process like a traditional waterfall approach where you really don't get feedback till the last moment that also hampers. And then, of course, the last thing uh, and the most important thing is having the right mindset. You might have all of them, but the mindset towards the quality or the, the professionalism, if that is low or that is absent, then yeah, nothing works. So my answer to this question is when you address a agile transformation, when you go into a transformation, that's exactly the thing which will address the, both the process and mindset. So you are already addressing half of the problem. Now, when teams try to address the technical debt, they will get ample support from the organization uh, from a mindset and from process point of view, but then they can also extend and take this as a leverage to focus more on the skills and tools so collectively they can address the technical debt. Thank you. Good. Any more questions? None so far, actually. Okay. Let me, let me see if I can add something on the chat. And uh, one of the things, uh, um, I also uh, do some trainings uh, from uh, scrum.org, I'm, I'm a PhD, where I do a, P, a professional scrum developer course. So a course like that is something which we address on these four aspects. As a development team or as a product owner, how can you focus on improving the process so you can get to know technical debt sooner or avoid it, what kind of strategies and how you can have the right mindset to ensure you always focus on the quality and also focus on what kind of tools or what kind of skills that you need and acquire and sharpen your skills to uh, effectively manage technical debt. All right, on that note, I'd like to end this webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Good luck. Thank you.